My parents, I was blessed by praying parents, and they were praying for me, I know, during that time. Amen. And they provided practical support to us for the rest of their lives. During that period, I must admit that I was looking for meaning, satisfaction, and connection that are all, and these are all um, aspects of deep spiritual hunger. I didn't recognize it at the time. It is now 52 years since I became connected back to the Lord. Now prayer remains a vital part of my life, yes. sustaining me even when yes. the prayers seem to have gone unanswered. Because my belief and trust, belief and trust, remember that, <laughs> belief and trust are not only in the power of prayer. I wasn't only focusing on the power of prayer, I was also focusing on the character, the faithfulness, and the wisdom of God. Amen. Amen. Uh, the next thing on the agenda is uh, our anthem.
We praise you that you have met every single need that we would ever need. And Lord, we bless you. We offer praise. We offer the sacrifice of praise. This morning with the fruit of our lips, giving thanks into your name. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to speak into our lives today. And Lord, we bless you. Thank you, Lord, for the peace of God that surpasses human understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have to address the atmosphere as God's people. We create the atmosphere with our presence and with our praise to God. We're so grateful this morning for Brian and his lovely wife to share with us this morning one of our missions that we support, the police chaplains, and he's going to speak to us briefly concerning uh, what is going on. We know that it is our duty as Christians to pray for those who are in the leadership. And clearly, we need police. Amen. And clearly, Amen. we need chaplains to pray for the police and the people that they have to deal with. Mm -hmm. With no further ado, Brian Allen, please come to speak. Yeah. God bless you, brother. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and to share a little bit with you guys. I appreciate this church and many, many years of support from you guys, uh, the prayer support, the financial support, and just bringing us in to share. And then I usually get to go have lunch with some of you guys, too, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys just for, for being a church that uh, reaches out to us and loves on us as chaplains. Chaplain Jim and I both are still serving as chaplain, Jim is starting to retire, so he's working a little bit less hours, um, and we are uh, in the process of trying to find another chaplain to eventually replace him, but really appreciate your prayers. An update for you on, on my health. Some of you I know here knew what happened to me last month, you've been praying for me. Um, I was with it about on uh, September 28th or so. I had a lot of stomach pain, not sure what was going on, went to good Sam. Turned out that my gallbladder had gotten infected and messed up my liver and intestines and a bunch of stuff. So I had to have my uh, gallbladder taken out just about a month ago. And so um, it was uh, a little weird being days before I was in the hospital visiting people and then turned three days later, there's the chief of police and all kinds of other officers are visiting me, which felt kind of weird um, to be on the other side. But it was, I'm grateful for those that, uh, that care for me and take care of me as well. So thank you, you guys, for your prayers um, through that. I'm doing really well. I'm, my scar has healed, and the surgery went successful. Now I'm just trying to figure out uh, all the fatty stuff that I'm not supposed to eat. Right. So I'm really careful. I lost 17 pounds, which is a, a nice thing. However, it's a lot of a lot of weight in a, in a two-week period. But I'm eating healthier. It's better for my heart. It's better for everything else. But uh, God is is uh, consistently in our lives and always there to encourage us and help us. And I'm grateful to those that especially my wife who took care of me. Both my kids are away at college, so she had, had to deal with me 100% herself. Uh, but I appreciate uh, your guys' support and all that. Um, you guys often ask me the kind of the morale of the police department, where we at? A few years ago, it was a, a tough time to be a police officer. It still is today, but uh, the morale has, has, I think, turned around a lot in the last few years. Um, that We are getting a lot more uh, people that want to be police officers again. Uh, we just graduated out another academy. We got two other academies going. Um, in a few months, we'll be graduating out another 27 police officers on the street. So that is great. Um, about uh, two months ago, we had one of our police officers uh, over kind of by Bound Medical uh, went out on a domestic uh, violence type of call. And uh, the, the guy, who's a coward, reached out the balcony, shot his gun, and shot her right in the stomach. And you probably heard about it on the news. Her name is Erin. She is a believer. She believes in Christ, goes to a church in Morgan Hill. Um, and we got really close to losing her. So that, that definitely kind of rocked the morale a little bit. To see, that was uh, in the history of our city, that was the first female officer that we've ever had shot. And so I think uh, her, her husband is also a police officer as well. And so uh, that was a, a really tough thing for, for our uh, officers to deal with the fact that we almost lost another one of our officers. But she's doing well. A lot of people have asked me, how's our girl doing? You know, we heard on the news, we haven't heard anything since. She went home last week, um, and when she went home, she's had six surgeries, and she still is in recovery and doing all kinds of uh, rehab and all that. But she's doing well, her morale is up, she's just happy to be home. 
um, happy to not be in the hospital with no more surgeries. So she's doing really well, and that definitely was an encouragement to the officers. There was, I think, about 200 officers that lined the halls and the nurses and doctors as she came home and walked out. We could have very easily, very close to having another funeral for a, a fallen officer. So we're, we're grateful that God saved her. She's doing well. Um, I have a lot of stuff as a chaplain that we do that's not fun, like dealing with that, um, dealing with officers that are going through hard things. But I also occasionally get to do some fun stuff. So two weeks ago, I actually did a wedding for a police officer and his wife uh, is works for the FBI, so they're law enforcement family. And so I had an opportunity to, my wife and I, to meet them, get to know them, spend time with them, and be able to officiate their wedding. And so there are good things that I get to do as well. It's not all hard. Um, but just a, an example of uh, a story of kind of what we do. Um, I had a lot of what I do is I don't know if someone's sick, I don't know if someone's hurting, I don't know if someone's having a hard time, unless someone tells me. So I have a board made up of retired officers and officers, and they, they are constantly letting me know, the chief's office lets me know, hey, this officer's hurting, this is going on, this is happening. And so I got a call last week of an officer who was having some heart problems and struggling and was gonna have surgery. And so I called him up and just chatted with him a little bit, and he's a new officer, and so he asked me, he said, you know, thanks for checking in, chaplain, but like, I honestly, I don't even know what a chaplain is, so what does a chaplain do? So I was able to explain to him what I do and what I'm there for, and I'm there to care for him and pray for him, and, um, and he, he just uh, got kind of teary on the phone, and he said, you know what, I'm so grateful that you called me because my girlfriend and I were really struggling and fearful of this surgery I'm about to have because depending on how it goes, I might not be able to be a police officer anymore, and I'm nervous about that. He's new in his career, he's in his mid-20s or, or late 20s, and so I was able to pray with him and talk with him, and he was just so grateful. He said, you know, we, we, we are... Uh, believe in God, but don't always know if God, you know, is listening. And the fact that the chaplain called me and checked in with me, um, it, it, it encourages me to know that, like, there's people like you that are praying and that are out there. So it was just one of those divine appointments, being able to encourage him and talk to him and share with him about, uh, you know, who I am and what we do. And, what, and then he said, you know, so you're, you're like a man of faith. Like, what do you believe? And so I was able to, like, talk to him that I'm a Christian and here's what I believe. And and so it was a really great conversation. And so I'm grateful for how God allows me to be able to do that on, in the capacity of, as a police chaplain for the city of San Jose, um, who is, you know, separation of church and state. We're not supposed to cross lines, but as a chaplain, I cross lines all the time. And that's because God gives me these opportunities. And, and the city is okay and actually wants me to do what I do. And they're grateful for, for the ministry. So we are uh, I'm glad to be able to do that. A lot of things that I've been dealing with lately, too, we've had a lot of really hard child deaths in the city, some drownings and different things. And so the police officers that go out to these calls and try to do CPR on these children and do all that, they, that's uh, when you see three or four children die in front of you in a two-month period, it really messes with you. And so one of my jobs is to go alongside and support those people as they're going through that hard time. We have something called a debrief. We bring in a counselor, and that counselor and myself and others really uh, just minister to that person, care for that person, and kind of help them through the process. And so we've had a lot of those lately. So you can pray for me as those are really hard moments uh, that officers need. Just uh, if they just push it down, go, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. You know, back in the day, that's what cops would always say: is I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And they wouldn't really deal with it. And now this younger generation, they're, it's good that they're learning to deal with their emotions and their feelings, realizing that when you see something traumatic, you can't just push it aside and go, I'm fine. You need to deal with it. And so we're really working hard on that. Um, I also just every day get to walk the halls at the PD and I just ask for prayer for, for the divine appointments because I walk the halls sometimes and I don't really talk to uh, super long conversations. But other times I bump into someone who really needs to have their chaplain pray for them, encourage them. And I'll spend two hours at the PD when I bump into somebody just talking. So those are um, just great things. I also, we work a lot with our retired cops. We have about 800 retired cops that we connect with. Some live in Idaho and other places, but they all, a lot of them as they've gotten older have health issues. We, I think we lost about four retirees that passed away this last month. And so they kind of go in cycles and that's tough for some of the other retirees as they see their friends that they've worked with for years and have been friends with that pass away. So we, we there from the brand new officers who just retired or just got hired to the ones that retired 45 years ago and they're 90 something and they're uh, happy to have lived a great life. 
Um, and there's a couple things you can pray for us as far as as Jim is getting ready to retire completely eventually. We have been searching for a couple of years for some a new chaplain, and so that's a great prayer. It's, it's a very unique position to find somebody who uh, fits what we're looking for, um, and so um, and it takes some of just the right person to be able to connect with police officers. So just pray that God will help us find um, that man uh, to be the next chaplain to help with us. Um, and then also, as I said before, just pray for those divine appointments like I have with this officer last week on the phone and as well as the ones in the hallway, that there are no there's people that need our, our touch and our care, and yet I don't always know who those people are unless someone tells me. So just pray that God will continue to give us those uh, conversations. And then one other is we have an officer whose uh, four-year-old, five-year-old daughter um, got uh, E. coli and has had massive uh, problems since then. She's up at Stanford, pretty much on her deathbed for the last three weeks. And the odds of her getting out of that is, is uh, really tough. And so I've been uh, ministering to him a lot, just kind of helping him um, be there. But I, I, I'm blanking on her name right now. But if you could just pray for the little girl up at Stanford, it would just be uh, a huge answer to prayer for this officer and his wife. And they have also have a one-year-old too. And so they're pretty much living in the hospital room. So I've been caring for him and all that. So just be praying for that family that God would, would come in and heal her. So thank you guys for your support. And I appreciate um, all that you guys do to, to listen to us as well as hear us. So thank you. She is a much of a part of the ministry that he's engaged in. And uh, as a minister and uh, being married to a woman, um, he is his best because of her. And so I'm going to ask you to stand with me and we're going to pray for this couple as God uses them to speak into the lives of fellow and former officers and their families. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this couple, God, that you have called out yes. and you place your hands upon their lives yes. to speak into the lives of others, God, who live with the threat of danger. Yes. Father, we ask that you will anoint them and keep them and protect them from danger, seen and unseen. And Lord, may the words that you give them find a lodging place in their hearts as they speak into the lives of these men and women yes. who have been called to serve and protect. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 That will take the place of Bob Simon's prayer.
issues, reoccurring issues in her body. For those of you that know Denise Green, and uh, she's in Las Vegas in the hospital. trying to survive. Know that God never, ever wanted any of us to suffer. He never wanted that. He never desired that for us. But because of the invitation of sin, our world came under condemnation, and we died, we suffered. I'll be talking to you briefly about that. <sighs> Father God, we are so grateful that you're here to speak into our lives and to minister in a way that no person Lord, as you have taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, bless Wayne and Connie Fortner. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen.
Um, oftentimes, when there's instrumental music, we have no idea where the inspiration for this particular piece of music comes from. There's no name other than like sonata or symphony. I don't have anything like that to share with you about this piece. But this was written by the great composer Johannes Brahms, who was a great believer in God. And I just wanted to give you a quote from Brahms before, I, before we play this together. Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Amen.
for you. Understand that. Understand wherever you are in your life today. Whatever is going on in your body that you are aware of and not aware of. God is for you. Understand that. Understand that. The word of God says, if God be for you, who can be against you? That ought to cause you to celebrate the fact that God loves you, he knows you, he understands you, and he wants good for your life. Amen. Not just momentarily good things, but good things eternally. He has purpose in everything that happens to us, that happens in our lives. I want to share with you, in your suffering, all of us are suffering something. Hello, somebody. Every single person on the face of this earth is suffering something. Because this world is not the world that God planned for us, but this is the world that God allows us to exist in because of sin. And everything in this world is under condemnation. We live in a broken world. And every person that's born into this world is born into brokenness. So we can understand what it is to have our hearts broken. Have you ever had your heart broken? You know what that feels like. And sometimes people don't have the words to help you in your broken state. Because they have not entered into the kind of situation that you have entered in in your brokenness. I pray that in these few minutes, and there's only 10 minutes left, that whatever you are dealing with in your brokenness, that there will be an undergirding of the Spirit of God to comfort you and to let you know that you are not alone. Because the enemy wants you to feel like nobody understands. And I'm all alone in this situation. Jesus has promised you that he would never, ever forsake you or leave you, even if you walk away seven years or more. The Lord is still there. He is still there knocking on the door of your heart because he loves you with a love that we can't even begin to comprehend humanly. How can God love me knowing that I have transgressed according to his purpose and plan for my life? How can he love me when I've denied him, when I have even Curse his name. How can he love me? He's God. <laughs> He's sovereign. He can handle your frustrations and your anger and your disappointment because he is God. He is sovereign. Amen. And he knows our human frailty. And he chooses to work with it. He chooses to work with us. He chooses to use us. 
I'm going to read to you our scripture text this morning. It is in 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And as I look through this text, it seems as though nothing has changed. That the church is still dealing with the same issues that Paul dealt with when he wrote this passage of scripture. Trying to encourage the Corinthians who were struggling with their identity in Christ Jesus. We struggle with our identity in Jesus Christ. Because all that we have known is our flesh. And we've got accustomed to living by our flesh and not living by the word of God and walking in faith in the unseen. Paul writes in chapter 1, verse 3, he did a greeting. He says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, not some affliction, but all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we have ourselves have been comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Never say, never say that nobody understands my suffering. Nobody understands my pain. Nobody understands where I'm at in my spiritual walk. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you also share in our comfort. God has been positive because of your acknowledgement in regards to the gift that he has given you in the person of Jesus Christ and you have accepted him into your life and received him as your Lord and Savior. And you are still in this body of clay dealing with issues of life dealing with struggles, dealing with temptations. God understands where you are. Paul was not held in high regard among the Christians in Corinth. They knew that he was sold at one point and that he was one who wanted to destroy the works of God. And he had to remind them that his appointment as an apostle came from God and not from men. That he wasn't politically lined up and, and associated with them to get his position. God himself put his hands on his life when he was in his state of rebellion. God is still putting his hands on people's lives in their state of rebellion. You see, we don't know what's going on in the hearts of people. And as they are acting out, we don't know what God is dealing, how God is dealing with them in regards to his plan and his purpose for their lives. And God's plan and purpose for our lives is for good. Understand that. God did not create you for evil. 
He did not create you to be succumb to evil. He created you to be his representation on this earth and that you would reflect his glory, that you would have to the ability to demonstrate his character in the way that you conducted your lives, even when the world was against you. Paul was an apostle appointed by God with all the problems of Corinth. Paul calls the Corinthians saints. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He calls them saints. Are there any saints here this morning? We'll answer the call of being saints. God calls us and separates us. He takes us out of this political Christianity, this political upheaval, this corrupted world, and he sets us apart. Anybody been set apart? Yeah. Called out of this dark world, this political dark world, and set apart for God? God help us. We are in a terrible, terrible place in history. And people are complaining, but not praying. People are politicking, but not seeking God. And we are in a state of confusion as a country. God is not the author of confusion. But peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what God gives you. Peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul calls the Corinthian saints among all those also in the region who might read his letters, the work of Holy Spirit in their lives and our lives is an ongoing process as we endeavor to be effective witnesses for Jesus Christ. Choir. You're here to witness for Jesus. When you don those robes every Sunday, you're here to witness for Jesus Christ. You're here to magnify your God who has saved you to have an eternal relationship with him. You represent him. Don't just casually put the robe on. Don't just take it as, well, I got to sing. Treat it as a glorious opportunity that God has given you in your suffering to sing and praise and worship him. That those who are in the audience who are suffering, who are dealing with issues, may be blessed because of you suffering but yet you are blessing and praising and worshiping God in your suffering and not allowing your suffering to overwhelm you to the place where you don't see Jesus in your suffering. And you who are part of this great audience and great congregation here, you came this morning in your suffering to be entertained? I don't think so. To have this preacher stand before you? I don't think so. But I think and believe that you came here to experience God's presence. Amen. Because all through the week you heard this and that and all of the bad news and you came to retreat from the world because when you are here it's a sacred place Amen. it's a holy place Amen. it's a place where throughout the week 
you have been dealing with, but you've come in here to experience some peace and some joy and some time of refreshing of your spirit from the presence of God. And you had to fight the foes, those things that are unseen, the negativity. Well, he's just going to say this, and they're just going to do this, and they're just going to do that. Why do you go? We go to have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ because we are people who are suffering. And in order for us to be able to encourage other people who are suffering, as well as we carry our own burdens and our own heartaches and our own heartbreaks, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to speak into our lives, to comfort us, to let us know that He's there. Regardless of how I feel in my body, how I feel in my mind, how I feel in my spirit, he is there. He is there. And all you need to do is just open the door of your heart. The scripture says, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near. As you draw near to him, breakthrough is yours. The touch of his love, of his compassion, of his concern for your life and your struggle to just maintain your life here in the villages with all the changes, with all the things that are going on. He sees your struggle. He sees your sacrifice. He understands your pain. And he's here to comfort you with his presence. Consistencies, my brokenness. Lord, don't allow my brokenness to deprive me of your presence and comfort in my life. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask this. Amen.
of the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.